International Relations Lecture Number 9, Critical Theory. Theory is usually understood as um, a tool for disclosing reality. We use theories to study a world that is generally so complex that we can't get to it as it is. And therefore, we articulate theories that help us understand the world in certain terms. So, usually theory is understood in technical and practical, pragmatical terms. In IR, this understanding of theory has been thrown over by Robert Cox, who argued that theory is not at all neutral towards reality. For Cox, all theoretical perspectives sustain, one way or the other, the interests of certain groups, implying that they are some way always political. Or, as Cox put it famously, theory is always for someone and for something. And in order to make that point, he distinguishes two kinds of theories, problem-solving theory versus critical theory. For Cox, problem-solving theory is what we usually understand with theory. It suggests that there is a problem at hand or a set of problems think about. Uh, in physics nowadays, we understand problems in terms of quantum physics and string theory, etc., and we use theory to solve those problems. So what theory does in that picture is that it actually functions within a paradigm, within a mode of thinking, within a, an understanding of the world. And within that paradigm, it starts looking for answers. Critical theory questions the paradigm itself. It doesn't try to resolve any answers within the paradigm, but questions the paradigm as it stands as a whole. So it takes a position outside of the order uh, in which we solve problems. So this could be read as follows. Problem solving theory resolves puzzles within the order that we have, and therefore it sustains that order. While critical theory challenges the order that we have and therefore tries to change it. This is how you can see that both of them are political. By sustaining the, the social order, problem-solving theory actually benefits those for whom the social order is a good thing. While critical theory, by challenging the social order, benefits those who feel that the social order or experience that the social order is shortening them. Right? So both of them are involved in the game of shall we change the social order that we live in or shall we sustain it? And it is for, from that perspective that theory uh, is always for someone or for something. The origins of critical theory mostly lie with um, neo-Marxism as we've been discussing earlier in one of the earlier episodes. Um, and very closely tied with thinkers such as Nietzsche, Weber, Hegel, and uh, particularly Antonio Gramsci and his theory of hegemony. And this line of thought has been brought together in the 1930s and 40s in what has been called the Frankfurt School. Um, and these were thinkers uh, such as Adorno, Horkheimer, Benjamin, etc., etc. And they drew from Marxism this idea of a superstructure, that capitalism is not just a um, material mechanistic process of market exchanges, but it carries with itself a cultural and social project, a project of indoctrination or of what has been called ideology, right, uh, through which the material practices of capitalism legitimize themselves. So the Frankfurt School focuses less on the material side of capitalism and more on the cultural production of capitalism. For instance, Adorno and Horkheimer um, famously studied the way in which popular music, but also advertising, um, link in uh, or produce a, a, a culture of uh, consumption and immediate um, fulfillment of desire, which links in very, very easily with the needs of the capitalist project. 
Later on in the 1970s, uh, 80s, up to now, the Frankfurt School project has mostly been dominated with, by, by uh, the figure of Jürgen Habermas, but also people like Axel Honneth have been very important there. And they have continued the project, but less so with just a critique of the cultural aspects of um, uh, ca capitalism, and more with trying to articulate where possible alternative spaces could be found and how they could be uh, made larger. The core of the critique of the Frankfurt School um, doesn't simply lie with capitalism. It takes a sort of a broader perspective and it critiques enlightenment as a project. Now, the Age of Enlightenment, which started in the 17th, 18th century, um, was a, a cultural project that rose in, uh, in um, uh, Europe, focusing on the strengths of reason, science, emancipation, individual freedom, and fighting um, um, traditional authority, fighting religion, fighting oppression, etc., etc., etc. So the way we understand enlightenment usually is that it brought us science, it brought us democracy, um, it brought us the emancipation of the people, um, it brought us freedom, etc., etc. However, there seems to be a problem. Because the way we tell enlightenment as a sort of an emancipatory project seems to be only one side of the coin. And it's no coincidence that the Frankfurt School authors started writing directly after World War II. And their issue was that in many, many ways, the, the horrors of World War II, the Holocaust, fascism, but also communism um, and technological warfare up to the nuclear bomb seem to come out of rather than to contradict the Enlightenment project. Right? Fascism, communism, um, um, totalitarianism seem to be actually projects that are quite in line with the massification, um, with the technification, et cetera, et cetera, of the Enlightenment than going against it. Apparently, Enlightenment can produce horrible outcomes. So, rather than focusing narrowly, as the Marxists did, on capitalism as the problem, uh, they take the Enlightenment as a whole as a problem. And there is something wrong with it, but we find it incredibly difficult to see. Um, we usually tell what we call Enlightenment in those optimistic stories of freedom and equality, uh, which makes us lose out on the fact that it creates all kinds of violence and um, uh, horrible horrors that we find just very difficult to see and that we usually put on the plate of the non-enlightenment. To give a brief example, um, since the enlightenment uh, understands secularism to be good and religion to be backward, uh, the way we've understood uh, Islamic fundamentalism from the 1980s on, or since 1979, is as a sort of a back step back from being enlightened to being sort of uh, medieval. And as a result of that, we miss out on the fact that Islamic fundamentalism, as every kind of fundamentalism, religious fundamentalism in the world right now, actually is an extremely modern response to the enlightenment. It isn't something pre-enlightenment, there's a response to the enlightenment, and it carries within it many, many aspects of the enlightenment. For instance, the use of technology, etc., etc., etc. So, um, Islamic uh, fundamentalism, to understand that as something pre-modern, misses out on the fact that it's exactly modern and completely entangled with um, our enlightenment project in many, many ways. So the starting point of the analysis is that there's something wrong with our enlightenment culture, and we want to change that. But problem solving won't do it. 
we live in a paradigm of enlightenment thinking in which technology, um, individualness, uh, consumption, etc., are so strong that we can't just work our way out of that. We need a more radical form of change. The problem is, however, that such a radical form of change is not easily accessible to us because our knowledge comes out of the culture that we live in. Right? So we can't just start knowing outside of our own historical and cultural context. Our knowledge is, as it's often called, situated. And therefore, where we speak from is important, and we speak from our own culture. So, most likely, our attempts to make the, uh, to, to correct the wrongs of the Enlightenment will actually be Enlightenment solutions for the problem of, problem of Enlightenment. So, the only way out of here is some form of self-reflection. Using our own experiences as entry points for grasping where we are culturally produced, where we are being situated, and reflecting on the limits of our knowledge and the ways in which social arrangements are naturalized in our everyday lives. <coughs> Think about the example I gave earlier about Horkheimer and Adorno. They use um, popular uh, music as a way of understanding um, how the political permeates our everyday lives. And it has to do with a praxis of self-reflection that they can start understanding something as banal as pop music, or in their case, jazz music, um, um, as a tool for um, capitalist practices. So for critical theorists, all knowledge is political. That includes the science, that includes the arts, engineering, etc., etc. And therefore, whatever we take to be a normal is already a political order, which is partly invisible to us because we, like fish, can't see the water that they swim in. We just swim in the order that we grow up in. And what happens is a process of forgetting that has been labeled reification. We reify the social constructs that we grow up in, thinking that they are somehow real. All right, so the, the, the social environment that we grow up in is one that creates winners and losers. It's one that creates um, injustices and violences. But we forget that this just a social order that comes out of our social practices. And we just start understanding that order as a natural given, as something that's just well, the way it is. So in that sense, we're caught in a trap. We live in a society that is violent, but since we come out of the society ourselves, we reproduce it as the only order that is available. But the critical theorists argue, since our knowledge production is also always political, we can try to use it against the dominant order. We can try to unthink ourselves, at least partially, from that dominant order. So let's give some examples here, uh, three to be exact. Stephen Gill uh, wrote a lot about the politics of globalization. And he argues that globalization is not just a loosening of the ties between states and a permea permeation of states by non-state actors, etc., etc but rather that is a set of practices that are completely imbued with power. So countering the liberal understanding of globalization as a sort of a market that, that intensifies and in which there's more movement possible and creates individual freedom, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, his concept of market civilization is that globalization produces a neoliberal market order that instead of liberating us, it enslaves us. It creates a way of thinking in which we cannot do other than be a consumer, be a producer, etc., etc. And we start understanding the, the world through commodification, 
we understand the world in terms of commodities, rather than understanding, grasping our environment uh, in its own term, we see our environment in terms of products that we can use for certain purposes. Right. Um, simultaneously, we are being regulated through market mechanisms. We are being directed by the market. Um, the way that we interact, the way that, to give an example, the way that we relate to social media doesn't come very much out of us. It is a social media that pretty much inform us and tell us about how they should be used and how we to use them, right? So we are being constantly regulated and disciplined into a state of consumptive being. And because it's agreeable and because we don't see the mechanisms very clearly, we don't have a particularly big problem with it. We fail to see how much it alienates us and how much um, violence it produces. So the question is, of course, what then do we do? And what ways can we resist this order? We can go and say, well, uh, protest against the big CEOs of companies, but that's not going to replace that order. So what Gill tries to articulate is strategies that do not simply replicate the problem. And the core of those strategies are going to be something along the lines of trying to get into a relation with one another that is not instrumental, or at least minimally instrumental, in which we do not understand each other uh, in terms of an object that we can use instrumentally, but rather try to get away from that mode of thinking. You saw some of that in the um, Occupy movement, uh, where people um, were not clear about what the solutions for the problem were to be, but tried to articulate spaces in which we would li or they would listen to one another, um, rather than uh, imposing solutions upon each other. Andrew Linklater is also a famous critical theorist in, in uh, international relations uh, who has been focusing on the question of harm and the question of violence. Um, and he asked himself, how does our civilization, how does uh, the Enlightenment culture deal um, with harm? And how has it created categories of harm that we find very visible and categories of harm that we find hardly visible. Right? And his idea is that we live in a in cultural setting in which certain kinds of harm and violence are almost going to be invisible to us, where others are going to be understood as highly problematic that has to be resolved. And that division between those categories is not coincidental, but comes out of the way in which uh, uh, our culture organizes it, itself. So, for instance, he has argued that the war on terror has decivilized whole categories of people, making harm against them a non problem. Think about the way we talk about um, um, Islamic um, um, groups that are fighting the West, right? That, that category has almost completely come to imply terrorism. And because it's equated with terrorism, they are understood outside of the realm of civil engagement. And because they're understood outside of the realm of civil engagement, some violence against them is just legitimate. Right. Um, so that means that whole categories of citizens in countries like Pakistan or Syria or whatever um, can be addressed violently in the name of stopping terrorism. And we don't particularly care very much about that violence. Well, of course, in the practice of it, uh, hurting whole societal groups, whole populations violently in the name of terrorism makes us the harmer rather than the harm. It makes us um, the perpetrators of violence. And for Linklater, rationality 
cannot be the way out. We can't reason our way out of this problem. Because rationality is just an expression of our culture. And therefore, it's part of the problem. So what he proposes is that we need some return to emotion. We need to be able to feel somehow, have empathy, have some form of compassion. And he's trying to articulate throughout his career ways of engaging uh, with the world through that compassion. Third example is Daniel Levine, um, University of Alabama, who uh, recently published a book, um, Recovering International Relations, um, arguing that IR has lost somehow its vocation. And he takes a completely different approach here than, than uh, Andrew Linklater or McGill. Uh, he argues that we reify um, our concepts, we reify our theories in international relations, and therefore we think that we have access to the thing in itself. Right? We can study the world as it is, so to say. He says, well, that is a problem in IR. If we understand the world as a set of puzzles or a set of objects that have to be studied, we're losing something. We're losing the fact that IR has always been normative to, uh, from the start. IR has been a discipline that seeks to resolve political issues in the world. And bringing that back to some positivistic or behavioralist study of things uh, makes us lose out on what is important in the world. So what he proposes is a project of what he calls chastising our reason, um, trying to train ourselves in becoming self-reflexive and to harbor compassion with the others that we do not see so much in the international. And this way we can blend IR with a sustainable critique, a imminent fundamental critique of the system that we live in, but articulated within um, a field in that system, in this case IR, interwoven with empirical knowledge and expertise. So for Levine, IR can refine its vocation of finding real solutions for violence and injustice in the world um, by being self-aware and critical of knowledge as we produce knowledge about international relations. Um, and then we can go back to addressing the main political and moral problems of our era. OK, to conclude, um, the idea of critical theory is to become self-reflective and to not fall into the trap of studying the world as it is. Hmm, is this navel-gazing? Um, it could easily lead to a sort of a practice of constantly being aware of our, being aware of ourselves. Um, to what extent does self-reflexivity help when we want to study something more than just ourselves? Second question, if knowledge is power and all forms of knowledge support political groups uh, and ways of being, what does it do to our understanding of IR? What does that make international relations somehow? It seems to conflict with the traditional mainstream understandings of IR as being state-centric, etc. But what do we get if we take a critical theoretical perspective? What image of power does that leave us with? And do we agree with the vine that IR is a field that has a vocation? that we have a purpose um, and that we should adhere to the purpose, that that is the core business that we have, so to say. Um, and even if we agree that there is a vocation in international relations, do we agree with Levine's definition of it? 